You're listening to the Can Dare Podcast, your sidekick in the quest for knowledge, power, and entertainment. So strap yourselves in and prepare for victory! Hello and happy Thanksgiving, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Can Dare, a tribute to comics and pop culture. I am Jeremy Colley. I'm Jack Doherty. And I'm Jake Runyon. And joining us today, returning to the show, actually, from Cinemassacre.com, the angry video game nerd himself, James Rolfe. Thanks for being with us today, James. Oh, hi. Yeah. Thanks for uh, reaching out to me for Star Wars, because I don't claim to be a Star Wars expert, just a fan like all you guys. Right, right. Well, we don't. You don't have to be an expert. That's I, where the better yeah. conversation is. Yeah. Right, fans yeah. talking to fans. Right. That's why I think you probably fit the criteria. If we were to get somebody on here who was a diehard Star Wars fan and knew every little mm-hmm. detail, we'd probably be stepping on our tails. Start oh, yeah. getting in heated debates yeah. too. Then Star Wars encyclopedias and all that. <laughs> right. We don't need that shit. Yeah, every <laughs> stormtrooper, every character has a backstory. <laughs> oh, jeez, <laughs> that they do. We have a very cool show planned for you guys at home today. We're going to be talking all things Star Wars. Tis the season, right? I mean, that we're a is. month out. Thanksgiving kind of marks that point where everyone starts getting extremely excited. You're a month away from a new Star mm-hmm. Wars movie. It's the 62 yeah, it's days actually, of Star Wars. There's actually a, like, a Star Wars season now every year. Yes. You, there's going to be a movie every December. There's good and bad things about that, too. But, yeah. um you're definitely right. They, Star Wars and Christmas kind of coincide together now. I've been saying that. Haven't I been saying that? Absolutely. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> if anything, I think Christmas has been eclipsed by Star Wars. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> Merry Star Wars. Seriously. I'd be happy with that. I'd yeah. be happy with that. Something all creeds and cultures can agree on. <laughs> <laughs> but before we do that, a few things to go over first. Uh, If you are Star Wars fans, which I'm assuming you are, if you're listening to the pod, head over to our YouTube page. We have the Star Wars and the Power of Costume video put up that uh, we put together over the summer. We went to the Cincinnati Museum Center, I think it was called, and uh, took close to 1,800 photographs of uh, actual Star Wars costumes used in all the movies and put together a uh, video walkthrough of that exhibit for you. It's about an hour long. It's really cool. We've been getting a lot of good feedback on it. It's a phenomenal exhibit. Yeah, Mm -hmm. check that out if you uh, are definitely into Star Wars. Then we have our uh, movie riff we just put up, Candare Movie Riffs, where we talk over the movie Grave of the Vampire. Very much in the same uh, vein as Mystery Science Theater 3000. So uh, a couple cool things to find out there. And uh, also, Candare is now on Patreon. We are on Patreon trying to get whatever support our uh, listeners would like to give us. Uh, any bit will help. Yeah. We offer the show for free, but it's not free to make. Right. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> Hurting our wallets. Yeah. <laughs> Bleeding for the past four years. Other than that, though, Jake, what about social media? Well, guys, I would be remiss if it, I didn't tell you once again to check us out on Twitter at CannedAirPod and Instagram at Canned underscore Air. Also, you can head to our YouTube page, like Jeremy said, to check out Crave of the Vampire, all of our PSAs, other fun stuff on the way, including a couple of Let's Plays, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah, the Candare yeah, Cave. Yeah. And on that note, if you are visiting a Wizard World convention to get a get your fill of comics and pop culture outside of this show, be sure to use promo code Candare, lowercase no space, for 10% off your purchase. And furthermore, if while you're there you want to represent your favorite podcast, it's us. Check out society6.com forward slash pod to uh, get some sweet merch. I guess the last five minutes have been about giving us money. Just give us your money. <laughs> Surrender your money yeah, to us. Yeah. But all right, with all that behind us, let's just uh, dive right into our Star Wars conversation. And uh, what we're going to be doing is looking at first the prequels, then the original trilogy, and then talking about the new Star Wars universe that, that Disney has got their hands on. And I was thinking what we could do with the prequels is first, you know, they're looked down upon so often. Yeah. There's there's some good in there that I think gets overlooked quite Somewhere. a bit. Mm-hmm. And, you know, everyone looks at the original trilogy like it's flawless. And, you know, to their credit, it pretty it's, much kind of is. But yeah. <laughs> there are some uh, things in there, some bad little things that uh, irk all of us here and there that I think we should uh, focus on and bring up. And then, again, we're going to land on our predictions on what to expect from The Last Jedi. So... 
Uh, where do we start? I guess uh, with the Twitter poll we did. We put yeah, Twitter yeah, polls out on uh, first the prequels to find out which was uh, the most watchable which and which was, was the, the least. And, uh, yeah. This is not going to yield any results that are going to come as a surprise it's to anybody. It's not going to blow anybody's mind. <laughs> <then>. <laughs> Episode 3, a whopping 67%. Episode 2, 27%. Episode 1, Thirteen percent. I think we had a few jokers who just yeah, wanted to. That's uh, being generous, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So where do we start, uh, James? I'm going to turn it right over to you first. What, what are some redeemable qualities from the prequel trilogy? Uh, well, me, I liked Revenge of the Sith. I, I was yeah. really happy with that one. Um, I didn't like the first two. I think they each got steadily better. Um, Correct. I think they kind of needed to warm up again. Uh, I also don't think it should have been a trilogy looking back. I think uh, Revenge of the Sith should have just been episode one. And then, I mean, you can't really escape now that A New Hope is called episode four. And you (laughs) can't really – they kind of, you know, (laughs) carved out that slate there they had to fill. Just like we need to make three prequel movies. But I would have just preferred one really good one. So that's what I think. But but the redeeming qualities – Actually, I did a video called um, Are the Prequels That Bad or something like that. Um, so I addressed a lot of it there. But I, th- I think the, the biggest thing for me, um, the thing that I loved the most was uh, The Emperor in Revenge of the Sith. Oh, yeah. Oh, I yeah. think really carried that movie. So, for yeah, sure. what do you guys think? I, I have got to agree, you know, not only with The, the Emperor, but I, I enjoyed seeing his come to power. Uh, but not only him, but uh, Yoda and Obi Wan. I think these are all three characters that uh, having a fleshed out past kind of gives you more respect for, especially sure. Yoda. They they really brought a not to say he was undignified in the original trilogy, but he was he had a little more of that comedic angle at least in the early. Yeah, parts. and there was more mystery behind his past. Like, this you makes know, what him was he? What did he right, used to be? Right. And this makes him an almost tragic character. Whereas when you see him with the in the originals, no prequel, you know, informing your opinion, you're like, oh, he's this crazy hermit who is, oh, but he's very powerful. Right. You see the prequels and you're like, here was this, like, proud, learned master whose time in isolation has kind of broken him right. a little. You know? Right, exactly. Well, when you're alone, you start going crazy and talking to yourself yeah, a bunch, too. So. That's all it takes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, not only that back to history, but seeing what he used to be capable of fighting-wise, <laughs> yeah. fighting Count Dooku and taking on Palpatine, though he uh, failed. But right. still, impressive battles. I mean, those you never looked at Yoda the same. I, I yeah. absolutely think Palpatine was the the strongest part of the um, of the prequel movies, though. Mm-hmm. Seeing his rise to power. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I thought... Yeah. They did a fine job with all the sort of political intrigue that went into that. I right. liked those scenes. Those, to yeah. me, felt like a, a, a more vital part of the story than seeing, you know, Anakin as a little kid on a desert planet. I like the idea of watching the formation of, like, the political atmosphere that mm-hmm. we already get in the original movies. Sure. I have to confess, I, I when I first saw Revenge of the Sith, I had no idea it was the same actor playing the Emperor until like halfway into the film or like pretty much the scene where he's fighting mace windu um once he started making that transformation i was like holy crap that's the same actor isn't it it's incredible it's absolutely incredible i had the same kind of uh epiphany i didn't realize and it's how much older he is and how he played a much younger he had the very uh patrick stewart thing happen and him at his younger age (laughs) apparently (laughs) in order for the timelines to uh line up but yeah, I agree totally. Uh, another thing uh, I would like to see, you know, Disney said next year I think is the Han Solo movie. Is that correct? That's yeah. right. Yeah. They need to do a Palpatine movie, oh, like when God. he was oh, young. Oh yeah, that, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? Though I it mean, would blow my mind. It really would to see him with his master and how he, you know, decided to start learning the dark side and you know, mm-hmm. just the way he ended up taking him out at the end to become more powerful, like he was. Yeah, telling him yeah. About. Oh my God! It yeah, would be like the backstories there. It's sort of like one of the, they cast out that like net. You know, you could go back and and tell that story. I'd I'd be really interested. I think a lot of people would because Absolutely. I I think after Han Solo, you know, what are they going to do? Like a Chewy movie? I mean, that's, <laughs> I don't I'm see that playing out really well. But it'll be like the Star Wars Solo. Christmas special. <laughs> oh, that's not exempt from today's conversation. <laughs> All Christmas specials because they come out on Christmas. That's a good idea. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> I think it'd be time to bring back the 
the original Christmas special? <laughs> oh, no, oh, boy. no, uh, no. Uh, we got. We'll pull that out of the bag a little bit later and rip <laughs> on it. But as far as watching, no, no, <laughs> no, no. I'm, I am stuck on the idea of a Palpatine movie and where that could go now. Oh, it's is incredible. Plagued me forever. I was like, yeah. why haven't they done this? Yeah. And I'm on record throughout, I think, uh, one out of every three episodes I mentioned that I always love the villains of a setting more than the heroes. Sure. And I can't imagine a better villain to have his own film, you know? Ugh. For yeah. sure. Yeah. Like, what, what elements can they bring in to make him relatable in right. this early point that almost alter mm-hmm. your perception of him in the later movies? You know, maybe his motivations aren't so horrible. Right, you know? right. See if he was really a whiny yeah. kid when he was younger, like the <laughs> other two. I would love yeah, to. Yeah, everybody s- talks about Vader, but I think yeah, Darth Sidious just gets kind of like overshadowed. Yeah, exactly. He could kill he never... Vader with you know the snap of his fingers. Right, right. Yet yeah. you never get the full grasp of his power in any of the movies, original trilogy or trilogy or the prequels. The first time, I mean, the first time that I saw uh, the Emperor move in ways that like made my jaw hit the floor we talked about already i think just last week in the clone wars when he took on uh, darth maul i mean that was one of the best fight scenes i've ever seen i that scene is still consistently awesome every time i see it, it's like seeing it for the first time if nothing else of that show existed except that scene i'd be like oh it's brilliant it's a work of art where maul is fighting for his life and executing every move with you know careful precision yeah Palpatine's just dancing He's around just in a, a joyful, <laughs> yeah. joyful state where it's just effortless for him and um, actively cackling while he does yeah. it. Yeah, it'd be cool to see him in a young state, kind Absolutely. of uh, wielding yeah. those new powers. But and I guess I should say that Revenge of the Sith was more of a prequel to Palpatine than I ever thought I'd ever get. Like I didn't even yeah. put any thought into it until I seen Revenge of the Sith, and, and now after that, I'm like, wow, I, I'm really interested in the Emperor. I want to see. More of what um, I mean, his pre-emperor days, of course. But like, um, I was I was just calling the emperor because that's what he was in the original trilogy. But then, pretty much, I didn't start hearing names like Palpatine and Darth Sidious till later. So, what right. what do you all prefer to call him? Wow, that's a I I still go to the emperor really, but I I yeah. mean Palpatine's always readily there too. I, it's always I like Emperor Palpatine. Yeah, Emperor Palpatine. Yeah. I I don't often refer to him as Darth Sidious. No. Because I feel like, and this is going to sound stupid, like I'm looking into it way too much, but when you call him something like Darth Sidious, that sounds scary and brutal. But something about a a scary, brutal character with an innocuous name is even scarier to me. Chancellor (laughs) Palpatine, you're like, if you heard that in a vacuum, you'd be like, oh, what, he's he's a bureaucrat? But, like, the fact that that kind of standard title Mm -hmm. and regular, at least as Star Wars is concerned, regular-sounding name still strikes fear into you, speaks to, like, the strength of the character, I yeah. think. And Darth Sidious is just, you're gilding the lily at that point. We've got to see this sometime, right? I mean, Disney's going to come wi- get wise I, at I some point, I can't imagine they right? wouldn't. You know. Come on. <laughs> come on. I mean, not that they've uh, been making a mockery of Star Wars. I think right. they've been doing well. I just think we might be getting a little too much. You know, even if he was, like, a, like an incidental part of another spinoff, kind of like Rogue One, where he made an appearance mm-hmm. and took at least some measure of screen time. I'd be content with that if they weren't going to make an entire feature film, but I'd love to see a dedicated, you know, 90 to 120 minutes, like just Palpatine. Yeah, for sure. I agree with that. Waking up, brushing his teeth, putting <laughs> yeah. on his black robe. <laughs> the life of Palpatine. He's got his nice big walk-in closet with it's got like three kinds of robes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, what I'm about sure you? it's done as a fan film already. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Jack? Redeemable qualities of the prequels. Seeing more of Obi Wan coming to mm-hmm. his power, growing up a little bit, going from Padawan to Jedi Master, and then getting his own Padawan. Not only that, but I think it cements the whole um, question behind why exactly obi Wan was living on Tatooine close to Luke. I mean, it just kind of yeah. seemed like uh, this guy down the road used to ride to work with your dad and you know some <laughs> shit, you know? But <laughs> it's so much more than that that wasn't really touched on a whole lot. And maybe I'm wrong about that, but I, not that I can remember. It wasn't touched on a whole lot that he was living in that house not far from uh, where you know, the Skywalkers were solely to watch over him. Was it by the original trilogy? I can't recall any specifics that, that sort of cover that idea. I think it's one of those things that's just sort of 
left to interpretation. It, it would be logical to assume, I think, right. that yeah. would be why he's there. But hell, I, I honestly can't remember if they address it or not. But no, I, I totally agree, though. Obi-Wan and getting his backstory was a great thing. I really liked what uh, Ewan McGregor did with that character, yeah. too. Uh, like he was really well casted. Oh, absolutely. No question. Absolutely. Also, in Attack of the Clones, he pretty much figured out what was going on the whole time with uh, the Empire building the clone army and stuff. He almost had that whole mystery of what was going on breached. There's a reason he was a general. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. He was... Uh, it was really uh, his ballad, the, whole, the prequel was, just yeah. watching his uh, evolution. And you know, it's funny, the way you say there was a reason he was a general, I was just thinking about this the other day. He is General Kenobi. Yeah. And it made me think, there's so much military and civil power placed on what is effectively this religious order. I can totally see how that kind of control over the civilized world would create a push from the opposite direction of the the Sith and all that, mm -hmm. you know, and anytime you give one faction too much power, you're just angering its rivals. And so right. I, I I thought it was interesting thinking of how, you know, Obi Wan Kenobi, the only training we're aware of he's had is Jedi training. It's not like he went to officer school. He's not Sun Tzu, you know, right. but he's got <laughs> all of this military power. Right. So it totally makes sense that when you push too far in one direction in some political climate, there's going to be a snapback toward the other. And it right. just so happens that in this world, we don't have, like I don't know, Republicans and Democrats. You've got space wizards and space Satan wizards. You know, there's really <laughs> nothing safe going on there. Space Satan with yeah, wizards. I, mean, I love that. I want to see how the rank structure works, because it seems like a lot of people just get these high commanding yeah, roles yeah, out of nowhere. Because like right. on Rebels... Ezra is like some lieutenant commander now or something like that. Oh, really? I'm yeah. Just passing just, him out like candy. Yeah. You know how to wield a light sword, so uh, <laughs> yeah. welcome aboard. You seem pretty cool. <laughs> Make you an officer. <laughs> you ever commanded hundreds of men in the heat of battle? No? Ah, well. You'll still pick out that up. sword. I like when you do that <laughs> spinny flipping stuff. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on. Uh, any other redeemable qualities, gentlemen? I know I mentioned more in mine, and uh, I know my friend Doug did a really good video, which was specifically that. It was just like all the different things that were really good about the original trilogy. We're getting to the part of late on this topic, go. aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I really, it's just all in the third movie to me. I just really love Revenge of the Sith. It was just really satisfying to see everything come to a close. I don't really seem to hear much about it other than Darth Vader saying, no. And yeah. I don't <laughs> understand what he was supposed to say there. Like, was he supposed to be like, confound it, my beloved Padme? <laughs> like, it's just no. It just says it all. That's true, but uh, it's just the way it was executed. The, the way he just a little pulled weird. his hands free. And the just body language. Stiff -legged, that he was like, all, yeah, what, Frankenstein's, Frankenstein's monster, yeah. his way out. And, um, I can kind of see that seeing as like he had just had all of his limbs grafted on, you know? What I would have preferred to see, and maybe this is stupid, but to her, her a broken man weep through that respirator. Oh, that might have been a little bit more, you know, impactful. at the death of his love and uh, his future children. It, it might even be creepy to have a, a very distinct noise. It's clearly him in distress, even openly weeping that like slowly tapers down into the breathing. Yeah. So you get that thought like this man is in constant psychological agony, but it's just become so routine, you yeah. know, to sort of create that noise and then s connect it to the other. I, I don't yeah. know. Maybe I'm not explaining it well enough. No, I, I see exactly what you you're know. saying. Something nonverbal, like yeah. something. That, I mean, he, he even, you know, can communicate a lot just through that mask, just in his like his posture and everything. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's definitely other possibilities. Right. And, you know, speaking of another instance where Vader says no and, you know, a lot of emotion coming from a molded plastic face is in the, <laughs> that scene in Return of the Jedi uh, where the Emperor is, you know, electrocuting mm. Luke and uh, Vader standing by watching. And, you know, they in the in the re-edits that Lucas did over the years, he put in him mm -hmm. saying no and then yeah. stopping him. But before that. You know, I think that no is way out of place. Doesn't need to be there because that's that was the beauty of that scene. The strength of it was oh, in, yeah. you know. the emotion pouring out of a molded plastic face that yeah. is not moving. Yeah. But you can, can see exactly the conflict. what he's thinking. Yes, it, it's brilliant. It's unless they casted brilliant. it just a little bit different. Because I know in 
I want to say it was uh, the Guy Fawkes mask. I think they, they changed it just a little bit to show some emotion. Is that right? I don't know if they did. I wonder if oh. they might have. Oh, I Because I, I, they've done that before with other stuff. I don't know. You know I don't know where this is going to fit in, but have you seen that um, Dave Prowse documentary? No, I have not. Mm-mm. I, I am blanking on the title, but I, I feel like it's called, like, His Name is Vader or something. Like, let me look it up real quick. Sure, take your time. But uh, it's really interesting. Uh, it's basically all about uh, Dave Prowse. Uh, sorry, let me just look it up real quick. No, you're fine. Take your time. He was just at a convention we were at, uh, too, I oh, think, within the yeah. last year or two. Oh, I Am Your Father. That's what it's called. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's I'm Your Father. Definitely check it out. Um, but there, there's one thing about the documentary that's like the biggest tease of anything I've ever seen in my life. And it's probably for legal reasons. But they um, they reshot the scene um, where he's unmasked at the end of Return of the Jedi um, unofficially as like like a fan approached him. And they reshot the scene with Dave Prowse under the mask instead of um, – uh, Sebastian, uh, what was the other guy's name? That I don't know. Mm-mm. Yeah, the uh, the other guy who they used for the end, and um, he didn't even know that they were doing that. Apparently, like they were filming that on like a second unit while he was filming other scenes or something. So, like he always felt that it should have been him. Like the, all that um, effort he put into Vader, like at the end of all that, like if they could have, you know, shown his real face, right. Um, almost like a, you know, a final bow at the end of a, you know, uh, play. Basically they, they reshot it and they screened it at a, um, uh, like a very small, uh, like theater. Like they, they kind of had like a small gathering and they, they showed it one time and the whole documentary builds up to that moment, but then they just can't show it because of, um, the oh, legal reasons, no. I guess. But oh, when you man. watch the documentary, you're so emotionally attached to it, and then the end comes up, and they just kind of like, you know, avoid showing it, and you're like, God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to get this immediately. I didn't even know this uh, existed. This documentary. Yeah, there's like a lot of um, like a lot of sadness to it. Like a lot of times, it seemed like he was sort of uh, pushed aside. Like he apparently like was the first to come up with the idea of vader being luke's father is that Um, right holy hell yeah i mean he kind of like i it's a very long story but he's he he brought it up in an interview one time and it i i'm trying to remember it's been a while since i've seen a documentary but he um it sort of came off i guess like a leak like he leaked the info before it happened but it wasn't really a leak because he came up with it on on his own. Like he was like, "Oh, wouldn't it be cool if Vader was Luke's father or something like that?" But what, watch the documentary though to to clarify it. Um, um, yeah, it's it's really interesting. I'm going to get that from the library. That sounds freaking awesome. I got maybe yeah. it's on Netflix. I, I am your father. I think it is Netflix. Um, is it on Netflix? I'm, I'll, I'll look it up really quick. Uh, Oh, man, I cannot wait. It just seems like a travesty that this guy who obviously poured his heart and soul into the character, mm-hmm. one of the most iconic characters of all time. I don't think I'm being yeah. hyperbolic. He's like one of the most famous um, – well, Vader is one of the most famous characters to be played by an actor who m- most people don't know. And it is on Netflix. I am your father. Oh, sweet. Thank you, God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be watching that this evening. That sounds amazing. You know, it's funny. Yeah. They say how much, what percentage of communication is done by gesturing and moving? Does anybody know? I mean, I, it's a decent percentage mm-hmm. that yeah. that portrays what you're trying to say. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, that's the one part that's universal. Exactly. So for you know, to give James Earl Jones all the credit to that character is extremely misplaced. You know, yeah. you can't. Uh, put this guy's performance to the side. It was his gestures and his emotion he put into that character that your eyes are seeing. You just associate yeah. it to James Earl Jones. If anything, he he deserves credit for being able to match the imposing quality of James Earl Jones' voice yeah. through his body language. Yeah, because you couldn't put James Earl Jones in Vader's suit and get the same impact. You'd get the good voice, but you'd get a little short, chubby guy. <laughs> oh, that's another thing. He actually didn't... He had no idea his voice was going to be replaced. I think oh, I, I heard no. about that before. Yeah. yeah, it was like time and time again he kept um, 
finding out things, you know, like he almost got his voice in. He didn't get that. He almost got his face in. He didn't get that. Uh, it's just like, yeah, it's just a really interesting story. That it is. And I cannot wait to watch that documentary. That's going to be freaking awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the only other thing I have really quick uh, talking about good things from the prequels that this isn't even something that the prequels themselves yielded, just more fan theory. But uh, Darth Jar Jar, the the fact that, <laughs> you know, there was the possibility that people were saying that Jar Jar concept. was a, you know, a, a, a undercover uh, Sith apprentice or something. That would have been so <laughs> amazing. Oh, wow. <laughs> have you not heard that, James? No, I haven't. Oh man, you need to look up Darth Jar Jar because Darth Jar Jar. It was the way it was set up was that you know through the prequels and or th- excuse me through Phantom Menace and through Attack of the Clones, you know he's playing this bumbling dolt that everyone's you know sick of him being in in the way, but that in the third movie it comes to light that it was all an act that he was one of the key elements pulling the yeah. strings and you said something Jake that was just really cool in that that reveal that I would I've got this image in my head that I can't shake and I'll never see it and that pains me of like when the ruse is gone he's on the council that gave you know palpatine emergency powers mm-hmm. the sith have won and he just kind of stands up a little straighter, looks down like his eye stalks recede, and yeah. his whole countenance changes. He's like, well, now that that's over with, you know, it just carries on. Comes this, into his own, pulls yeah. out a saber, and like, oh my let's God. fight. And there's all this fantastic wow. evidence, you know, him doing force-like flips, being in the right place at the right time, being exiled from Gunga City or the Gungan City, yeah. you know, in the first place. And there's all that evidence that you go like, yeah, it's good, but it's a fan theory, so you're looking right. after the fact. And then I recall reading somewhere that reception toward Jar Jar was was so toxic, it caused, like, some late rewrites that echoed throughout the entire prequel uh, trilogy. So that kind of lends credence to the idea that he was going to be this secret manipulator. I mean, the Phantom Menace, what is that? Is that Sidious? Not really. Hmm. He's present, you know. (laughs) Or Anakin, I suppose, yeah, but... I would have assumed, but... Right. Yeah, it is a vague thing. It's like, yeah, the Phantom Menace. So I don't know. I guess that was that's a good point. Jar Jar. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. It, it would have been so cool. A theory that that people have been like, it, it's just um, like a written kind of thing you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I don't think there was any like Jake was saying, maybe a whisper of it in rewrites, sure, but sure. nothing that ever came to even close mm-hmm. to being fruition. I but, think if that was going to be the case, it was aborted like too early on right. to really have made a difference. Wherever it came from, it was a brilliant it's idea great. and just would have added wow. some uh, serious spice to the, <laughs> it's This theory has gained so much traction. I recall us being at a convention and there was a guy dressed as Sith yeah. Jar Jar. Yeah, there was. He had, like fangs and shit. <laughs> <laughs> All wow. right. Well, very cool. We found some good in the uh, prequels there, I what think. What good there is to be found. Yeah, a lot, found. there's a lot more, and I think people will give it credit sure. for. And it's all Palpatine. Pretty much. It's all Palpatine. <laughs> well, let's look at the original trilogy now. We did all. We also did a Twitter poll on the uh, most, our, our fans' favorite of the original trilogy. And it's my unanimous. God, in a landslide, 100% <laughs> came back, Empire Strikes Back. Would everybody here agree with that? No. I think so. Jackson, it's my favorite, no. yeah. I like Return of the Jedi better. It's a toss-up for me. I think I always go Empire, but the conclusion of Jedi, I love it so much that it's, exactly. it, mm-hmm. it's a hard decision. But because Empire leaves it so open, it's you know it's the middle part of the story, I guess. But um, but I really love the ending of Jedi, so mm-hmm. it it is a tough one. But it, it's it's still Empire always comes out on top as as the, the overall consistent you know movie. Right, and I I would have to, um, but I, I'm really on the fence between the two. I was right in the fence with Jack there about my favorite being Jedi, but preparing for this segment right here alone made me realize how good that original trilogy is, just mm-hmm. as a whole. Yeah, I thought it would be a lot easier to find uh, talking points for this part of this uh, episode, but boy, was I reaching toward the bottom it's of the rough. barrel. I mean, there's. Not a lot that can really be said. Too, too it bad. It seems like most of the negative things you can say about the original are kind of nitpicky. You know, you and that's like, exactly yeah. what my list is, is a yeah. nitpick list. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, and I think there's some, there's, I noticed the most imperfection with the first movie, with with A New Hope. Right. Um, but it's all, 
sometimes with the best classics, there has to be some imperfection to it. It's just like I can see like all the things that might be wrong with it uh, are all excusable. Like it's just kind of like I, I don't know. Like when a, a work of art, if it's like too perfect, like you know, you know what I mean. There's almost like yeah. something too good. Star Wars kind of comes off like you watch it and you know that this is like like an accident film. This was like <laughs> this movie was just like a miracle that happened. It wasn't really like not every single thing was as carefully thought out as some other movies. It, it just seemed like you know he he uh, Lucas took from a lot of different sources. He took from you know Western culture, Eastern culture, and just put together this like sort of hodgepodge of little pieces of every classic story that was already told. And it just kind of came all together in this beautiful way. But, but yeah, if you really look at it, like, there's a lot of things that are kind of odd, um, especially in the setup, I think. Like, a lot of it is sort of like how they go from planet to planet or just which uh, – what is the um, – how the, how the whole story gets in motion is a little odd if you, if you want to pick it apart. But, like, I mean, first of all, they have the Death Star, which is this – you know they can destroy any planet, and they already show that they don't. They don't think twice about it. They, you know, right. uh, when they blow up Alderaan, it's like okay, they have this this weapon, and they're willing to use it. But they have such a hard time finding the rebels. And how many different planets could they have, you know, got to if they would have just did the same thing and just blew up any other <laughs> planet? They could have totally wiped out the rebels before they ever became a problem this is um, true so it's really like a miracle that the rebels ever got away and then the thing that always kind of um bugged me and i actually talk about this at the end of my one of my force awakens videos and i'm trying to it's been a long time since i got my head in here so so help me out here if i'm not remembering the details correctly um but uh i believe leia tells them to go um to uh uh which planet was it she Dantuin. wanted to Oh, Dan- Dantooine, correct? Yes. Okay, it wouldn't, which alone is confusing because of Tatooine. But anyway, right. that's not even the point. <laughs> um, that actually took me a long time to, to realize. I think I, I one time I was watching it with the subtitles and was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, like, just even like without that, um, like, they, they, uh, they end up going to the rebel base in Yavin. It kind of seemed like, why didn't you just tell them to go there? They could have skipped out on a lot of things like either way, whatever they did, you know, they, they encounter the Death Star and they end up getting like, you know, sucked in. Everything would have happened exactly the way it did, no matter which direction she would have told them to go. Um, but uh, she tells them to go to Alderaan, right? Right. Yeah. And then that gets blown up, but it get, but it gets blown up for an entirely different reason, because <laughs> Governor Tarkin is. He blows it up because it's her home planet. It's basically just a big fuck you, you know. Right, right. <laughs> he's doing it because he's an asshole, not because they were going there. But um, I don't know. I think the, the way the movie all connects the dots is a little strange if you if you really want to think about it. Um, I never thought about it like that, but that's the truth. It's, yeah, it's really true. It's I like think they did it just to. It was closest. Like they were, they ended up catching her on her way back to Alderaan. She said it was on Duntween, which was way too far away. I think it mm-hmm. was just a time thing that the Death Star had moved too slow that it would have taken way too long to get to that one to make any kind of point. And Alderaan was right around the mm-hmm. corner. I would love to know the miles per hour on the Death Star. Because <laughs> yeah. I don't no. think it goes in hyperdrive. <laughs> I don't think. Oh, I do think that for a reason. Actually, well, it's a, it's, sort, it's a you know theory like anything. But I, actually, a lot of people did comment and said that... Um, that if she told them to go to Yavin to go right to the rebel base, it would have raised suspicion. You know, like if they were going to take those blueprints, they needed to do something more um, on the down low. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense, but yeah, like it, it like you, you could argue that. You know, this is these are a lot of thinking points that are just now processing to me. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't look that deep at it, and I wish I would have. And all yeah, of this... like I wish I just put on the movie. I wish it could be a little fresher in my mind right now. But you know, <laughs> it's one of those things. It's like you don't think about that when you're watching it because, like, the movie's so good, it entertains you and it distracts you from any of those, you know, flaws. Right, for sure, for sure, and. You know, you mentioned the Death Star, and that kind of harks on one of the things on my list here. 
which have since been rectified, but the design flaws of the Death Star and of the ATAT. Now, yeah. Rogue One has come along and really kind of cleared a lot of that up. Okay, I, I there appreciate is... that they address that as a story element. That was like the only way to make it go down a little better. You know, right? But you know, why would you leave this exposed hole that just one thing down it will you know destroy everything you're working on? And then the ATAT. You know, when you first see those in um, Empire, you kind of associate it to being a snow vehicle. This is what the Empire uses when they're in treacherous, sure. snowy mm-hmm. situations. And you just For think, some reason. why? You know, <laughs> look, look how long the damn legs are on that thing. But uh, again, Rogue One kind of addressed that, showing them in that uh, Caribbean-like yeah. island. And you know... Where, you know, if they're walking through bodies of water, that makes a lot more sure. sense. Striding through, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they say all terrain, fine, I get it. But I think the point you're making, it all comes back... Now, this is me explaining it off, and if you have to explain something off like this in a movie... It means the movie didn't do a great job, right? Ultimately, I think it should it should be able to cover its own holes without you having to do the mental gymnastics. But mm-hmm. I think with the vulnerability of the Death Star, you know, Rogue One, say, take that out of the equation for my point here, and the vulnerability of the ATAT, I think it speaks to, like, Imperial arrogance. They make these big terror weapons. I mean, both of those things are hugely intimidating. Yeah. You don't see mm-hmm. them as like, you know, that's not their main battle tank. They right. don't have Abrams rolling down on the base because they want to send a message. Right. And they do that with big, scary, monstrous looking things that are maybe not well designed, but they certainly get the point across. Mm, that yeah. is a good point. Hmm. Wow. I never thought of that either. Oh, well, yeah. So you're challenging me here. I like this. I like <laughs> that's this. That's what we do. <laughs> no, that, that is a very good point. Just the, the, the magnitude. Just the simple aspect of striking fear, yeah, yeah, makes up for the design. I mean, is it is it more efficient to funnel all these lives and resources into a weapon like the Death Star, or to have a well equipped and well trained army? You know, yeah. if you had allocated those resources somewhere else, would they have been stronger? <laughs> a well, second they... Hoth battle. It's like they're just going to tie the legs up again. You know yeah. that, right? <laughs> yeah. But they'll be fucking scared. They'll be scared. <laughs> yeah, look what they brought to Hoth: half a dozen walkers. Yeah, with it's... the armies inside it, but. I mean, they could storm when they got there, but otherwise, there's a big ground troops on the rebel side. That right. they, now, there's another flaw. How slow was the approach of those damn things? Oh, I mean, Lord. they were just s- crawling at a snail's pace. Slow like, enough that they should have erased them with artillery long before. That any or the, of the rebels speeders. could have been like out of dodge, like long before they <laughs> yeah. ever made it to the and front. And if you're door. a guerrilla warfare type of faction, isn't that your like primary objective? Do the thing and then leave. Like, why yeah. are they enduring sieges like this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one thing that I uh, read online is that in this uh, new The Last Jedi movie, we're going to see a new ATAT called a Gorilla ATAT. Yeah, oh, they're was bigger. That the they're way bigger. One? Much bigger, yeah, yeah. much more heavily armored. I saw just a couple like shots, and they looked really yeah. cool. Yeah. So I've got a, a weird obsession with like assault vehicles. Like any kind of frontline breaking, impractically huge and dangerous sort of thing. Right. So I love that concept of like the busting down the door type of vehicle. It's like, hey guys, we're here. You, know, yeah. you establish beachhead with your biggest scariest thing. Right. Man, very intimidating oh. they are. Can yeah. you imagine if those things were real? Oh God. Jesus. I'd be <laughs> in the military right now. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to go next? Bad things about the original trilogy. I, okay. I have another one about New Hope, if if you want to hear it. Oh, I do. I'm dying. Sure do. Okay. Uh, you, see if you, if you follow my drift with it, but um, um, okay. So it's basically like how the movie ends, or how, how the last the last big action scene happens. Um, uh, you know, it it pretty much ends with a space battle, which was, you know, arguably it's the movie that made those space battles as popular as they were because you know late 70s early um 80s it was just like every atari game was about you know blasting ships in space they made like tons and tons of movies that that followed in the wake of star wars um you know it it was obviously if it didn't have that scene it would be you know it it may not have been as, as big as a movie as it was um, but that I always find that to be the least interesting because now looking back, that space battle is just kind of generic. It's just like, yeah. you know, ships shooting other ships in space. That That's the only part that doesn't really, it kind of dates it to me to like 
that late 70s, early 80s when everything was about space. That makes sense. And also, the, 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 I feel like that scene should have happened before the, 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 the battle inside the Death Star, because I feel like the, the most interesting part of it to me was when they were inside the Death Star and they were rescuing Leia, and um, when Darth Vader meets uh, Obi-Wan and, you know, he says, you know, I'm the master and only the master of either, evil Darth. Like, that's just like, to me, that's like the, the, the final battle of the movie. But right. it, the movie, of course, goes on. That, that kind of feels like it's about to end. But then it but then after they get out of the Death Star, they got to go back to the Death Star again to destroy it. So it's the movie's still not over. And there's a little bit of breathing space in between that, too, where I think in Return of the Jedi, they kind of did a better job with that because they have three set pieces happening simultaneously. They have the battle in Endor with the Ewoks fighting the, the walkers and everything. And then they have the, the flying into the Death Star thing where they're going to blow it up again. You know, they have, so you have the space battle. And then you also have Luke inside the Death Star uh, with, you know, Vader and the Emperor. So you have like all three of those scenes that it keeps cutting back and forth to. Right. Um, so they kind of have a better knack of like editing and having it all happening in the same at the same time where it would be interesting this to see what I mean, maybe it wouldn't have worked that way, but it'd be interesting to see what New Hope would have been like if they condensed it that way. Yeah, that's true. There's something to be said for keeping the energy up like that. That's yeah. why I think Jedi is my favorite because there, there was something going on constantly, even though it kind of slowed down a little bit with the Luke and Emperor part. But like with uh, mm -hmm. Empire, it starts off awesome with the Battle of Hoth, and then all of a sudden it just goes because they separate, and then it's just sitting yeah. on an asteroid fighting bats that live inside a big monster, and then Luke running around with a puppet doing flips in the jungle. <laughs> it's just the pacing is just so slow, and I get I can get bored real quick doing that. But one of the things on my list are from Empire when he's at the swamp, and a little bit from New Hope too. But just how fucking whiny Luke is! Like, oh, I can't do it. Oh, I'm yeah. never going to be able to do it. Oh, okay, you know, just, let's just let the galaxy imagine, burn. Uh, could you imagine if you saw Empire Strikes Back for your first time? Like, like it's in the theaters. It's a brand <laughs> like you saw it opening night. And you come home and you, you tell your friends about it and they ask you, oh, so how, how was it? And then you say like, oh, well, Luke's like doing a bunch of flips with the puppet and like. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, what? Uh, oh, what? sweet. You every time Star Wars, right? Every time I watch Empire, when he tries to lift the ship and he's just like, it goes in the water and he's just like, you want the impossible. Yeah, I yeah. always wait for Luke to just punt Yoda. While he's just sitting there, it never happens. But it would be so funny just to see it. I just wait for a hand to come out of out of screen and just smack you, Luke across the face. Yeah. Like, Quit being such a bitch. Get it out of the pond, you know. How old are you? Right. That's you ask the impossible. I'm going back to the hut. That's a, that's a good question. Do we have an exact figure for how old Luke was at the start of all this? I think he was 16. 16. Yeah. All right. Because his age feels what? Maybe it's just the events he goes through, kind of force him to mature like rapidly mm -hmm. but his age seems really inconsistent throughout the movies hmm. i think i've never paid attention to that like early on Mark Hamill? Oh, that's a good question he couldn't yeah. have been much past his i don't know late 20s yeah i, no I honestly idea. don't know i don't hmm. i think he was about 18 because i know leia was she was like 16 she was real young during that what yeah and then harrison was in his 30s i think mark hamill was around 18 or something like that the scene I keep thinking of is when his uncle purchases C-3PO and R2-D2 and brings them back, and Luke's working on them, <laughs> and he, like, sort of lounges back and plays with his spaceships. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, this man's going to have to destroy an entire empire in a few months. You know, it's <laughs> it's like, it seems like they start him way too psychologically young. Right. <laughs> if, if only in that scene. Like, you compare it to the next one where he's, like, all in black, defeating the lord of all space darkness. Right. You know, it's... Well, he's it's, like the homeschooled kid way out in the middle of nowhere. True. And then suddenly the real world comes <laughs> crashing in on him. <laughs> well, if my information's correct, it seems like Mark Hamill would have been, like, 26 on the That's release of thought. Star Wars. Mm. Or something close to that. 
Wow, that's a lot older than I would have guessed. Yeah. He seemed really young. Wow. So he played yeah. younger better than Chris O'Donnell in Batman and Robin. <laughs> well, boy, are we comparing apples and oranges here. Very common. Like they always, I always think of Steve McQueen in The Blob. He, he plays a teenager, but he, he looks much older. Like there's a lot of, it seems like they usually go with like older people to play younger, um, you know, uh, characters. Yeah. Right, right. You see that a lot in like horror movies where there is a plague of 20 somethings playing high schoolers. Yeah. Actually, Jamie Lee Curtis in Halloween, I know she plays, you know, like they're in high school, but I, I feel like they have to be older than high school. Maybe it's not fair. I just had like a, a really horrible, crotchety music teacher that looked just like Jamie Lee Curtis when I was in elementary <laughs> school. So oh. looking back, she always seems so much older to me, no matter which <laughs> movie it is. Uh-huh. Anyway, since I figured that was uh, super relevant to our conversation. No, I, I'm <laughs> glad you put it in there. I like it. It's, it's the pepper of the episode. Yeah, well, yeah. Weirdness <laughs> is the spice of life, right? Um, a few more things uh, I want to get out really quick on the original trilogy that kind of irked me. One, Chewie swinging on a vine to that ATST mm, yeah. and being like Tarzan with his Tarzan call. Like, come on. It's a little <laughs> silly. That was beyond freaking silly and stupid. But um, another thing was the not-so-graceful, quote-unquote, demise of Boba Fett. You know, oh, yeah. that whole fight scene right there kind of played out like a Looney Tunes fight scene where... You know, Han's blinded, right. swinging a stick around, like, what, what, where, where is he? And just absolutely, you know, <laughs> accidentally hits his jetpack, which uh-huh. sends him into the wall and down a hole. It's a very, you know, wily. It's an Coyote undignified end for what was built up to be like the galaxy's baddest right. hunter of men. You know? Now, there's been an extension of the universe, either via comics or whatever it may be, that has made, made it so Boba Fett did, in fact, survive the Sarlacc. Yeah. Somehow, I don't know how. Yeah. Can't imagine I, with I, a jetpack, it'd be too hard to get the hell out of there. Just crawled through the entrails and out this <laughs> rear end. You know, I think when I first saw Richard the Jet, I mean, there's so much going on in that movie. But like as a kid, I never thought of Boba Fett as like a character. I, I always thought of him as just like one of like the stormtroopers. Like yeah. there's more. Yeah, than, yeah, yeah. Because it's just like you got this like you know this metal armor and a mask. I just felt like there was more of him. And that he was just one of, like, a bunch of these guys. And it wasn't until later I started hearing, like, first of all, I never even noticed his name. I mean, he does say it. I mean, like, Han says it, like, very briefly. But I never noticed that he had a name until, like, um, gee, like, I mean, into the 90s sometime. Um, In fact, I think I first heard about it when uh, Shadows of the Empire came out um, for Nintendo 64. But, uh... But yeah, like like he his fan base, it seemed like it really grew. Like it didn't, it was, you know, like I didn't really hear people talk about Boba Fett till much later. Yeah, it was a very after the fact kind of thing where he became this big figure. Yeah, and really quick, just for uh, just humor me, Shadows of the Empire was that Dash Dash. What was his uh, name? Rend- yeah, Rendar. Rendar. Yeah. That, that was it. I couldn't remember. Thank you. Mm-hmm. But, you no, know, the, just the following that comes behind Boba Fett, you know, is built solely on just a few minutes of screen time and a badass <laughs> facade. And like us extrapolating how cool he must be right, for that right. to happen. And um, I guess it's okay to look at him as such a hard ass, but why? You know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a movie we'll get. I think his Boba popularity Fett, just came hmm. from the way he looked. Because, like, I was always a big fan of the TIE fighter pilots, the black right. ones. Yeah. Just because oh, they look cool as hell with all yeah. the oxygen hoses and stuff. But all you ever see is just their face for a second. You know, it's funny. I think in that way, at least in Force Awakens, Captain Phasma kind of mirrors Boba Fett perfectly. Right. Mm-hmm. She's mm-hmm. of that same template. You know, fancy armor, intimidating, talks a big game. Does essentially nothing except get their ass kicked in the right. movie. If you, but, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say it certainly seems like she's going to play a bigger role in the coming film. Yeah, yeah, it looks like they're going to have a fight scene. Her That's and gonna Finn. Be but awesome. um, one really quick thing uh, that video I mentioned earlier of the uh, Star Wars Power of the Costume exhibit at a Cincinnati Museum Center available on our YouTube page. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was they had Boba That's Fett. Awesome. Yeah, it, it was a cool video. You, sh- you should check it out. But anyway, there was a, uh, a display of Django and Boba Fett there that were back to back, and there was a plaque that uh, kind of gave the backstory of the design. And Boba Fett's uh, concept that was the originally Darth Vader. No kidding. That's what it was supposed to huh. be, and obviously huh. they went through changes, and 
they didn't want to scrap it totally, so they just made him into this, you know, kick-ass bounty hunter. But yeah, that was an original uh, uh, concept for Vader. That's got to have something to do with his personality. Or, I mean, not person. What the? F- <laughs> sure, his popularity. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> personality. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I've been doing fine till I get to the last word of every sandwich. You're I'm fine. not sure what the deal is. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's got to have something to do with his enduring popularity, right? You see yeah. this, and like, there's so much of that, like, minute tweaking things to convey a certain thing. Your brain goes, "Oh, he has to be important, right?" Even when ultimately he isn't. It's, right. I don't right. Know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. The, the, just the design of Vader in itself is really cool. You know, they went from that then to then a few different variations of what they settled on in the end. But also at that museum, they show different pictures of like the coming together of the idea. And it shows a uh, samurai helmet, you know, oh, with yeah. the big, th- the fan yeah. that the comes around Kabuto the back of the neck. head piece thing. Right. Then they put a, what was it, like a German dome skull on top of that with a yeah. little spike. And then they affixated a gas mask onto the person. It was like, this is the general round concept idea of what you're to create. And just, I love how that all came together. A yeah. samurai helmet, oh. a, ger- a Nazi Germany, like, s- uh, skull dome thing, and then a gas mask, like... I don't know. Something and, about and it that all just... kind of came together. And a to... cape. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine like this. Describing that is like, this is going to have this mask. He's going to have a cape, but he's going to be like breathing into a respirator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and thick cord corduroy pants. <laughs> right. Comfortable <laughs> and stylish. Are they? Co- That's right. They do have that texture to it, don't yeah. they? Yeah. <laughs> Over exaggerated corduroy. So he doesn't sure. walk he fast down the Death Star, like so you don't hear the. Whoop. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they give him straight up corduroy. So <laughs> zip, zip, zip. <laughs> Hard to take him quite as serious, yeah. right? I always kind of liked the, the more padded look of some of his armor, though. Right. Because it evoked this sense of, like, yeah, it's not big and flashy, like plated armor, but sure. it must be made of some space age material i mean if this is good enough for the king of all badasses right it's got to be pretty decent <laughs> he might look like a triple ply paper towel or whatever but right he's, right he's, he's tough right there was i hated uh the one thing about the vader costume that i didn't like in revenge of the sith was for there was something about the way they fit it or fit it onto hayden christensen at the end there that his the dome of his helmet and like the flare out behind was seemed a bit over exaggerated oh, yeah, it was to just me. Like a little too was much. that just me or does, oh, does other I'm, people I'm notice with that? You, yeah, I don't think I noticed. I know they kept the red lenses like he had in that. I a noticed, new Hope. but like when it goes from you know uh, Revenge of the Sith to A New Hope, it seems like in in, in the, uh, Revenge of the Sith that helmet's just a lot bigger than it typically is. It just irks the crap out of me every time I see it. might have been like, here, we're going to put you in this and we're going to, oh, it's not working too well. We'll try this one. It's like bordering on uh, Darth Helmet. You know? <laughs> like, I'll seriously. i at that again. Is there a, a certain shot where you notice it the most? Uh, when he's on the table after he just had everything put on for the first time and he's being brought up. And it could just be okay. the angle of the shot. But then even after he's brought fully straight up and, you know, Palpatine's like, Veda, can you hear me? And, and uh, even at that angle, when he's upright, it still looks too big. Now, by the end of the movie, when you see the side profile of him walking up next to the Emperor and when they're seeing the construction of the first Death Star uh, begin, he looks all right there. But it's like a straight on profile. There's something about it. Well, when we went to that museum, the Darth Vader outfit they had on display was Hayden Christensen's. Hmm. And I still feel like like seeing it in person, I was like, man, that still kind of looks huh. over-exaggerated. It might be in the slightest, but... That's all it takes. is It could be a centimeter off, and your brain's like, no, it's wrong. It's you wrong. Know, it's wrong. Just, I'm changing it. It's all of those things. <laughs> all right. Um, one more quick thing I want to touch on from the original trilogy before we move on to talking about The Last Jedi was... Another thing that's irked me I've never really spoke of that was cemented in uh, the original trilogy and is kind of stuck uh, with the Millennium Falcon wherever it seems to go, but the gunner seats. Okay, now these guns are on top and on the bottom of the Millennium Falcon, correct? Mm Mm-hmm. Now, when you are a gunner sitting in the in the seat, you are looking straight out a window. The barrels are hanging over your field of view, over or under. Right? Which would imply you're looking at a window that's straight down or straight up. Which right. Essentially, you're hanging in a seat there, right? I yep. mean, 
the, the, there's something I'm not like the gravity. I, I don't know. You're on I'm the not outside what I'm saying. part of the ship, so the gravity's less. Oh, is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> Ever since like, Jack got a job at NASA, he just can't <laughs> shut the hell up. Well, he, they space. go down a ladder to get to the one on the bottom, say. And next thing you know, you see them just so normally climbing into a seat, which what, by all laws of you know physics mm-hmm. or whatever should be hanging like, upside, upside down. down like, yeah. I don't know. That's something that's it, always it's always almost me, but like apparently. one of those things where people argue about the layout of the Overlook Hotel and The Shining. Yeah. The only thing you can do is reach that point where you're like... Shut the fuck up. It, just, it works, okay? It, just, <laughs> it's right. it's it works. I'll yeah, I, I looked at that Overlook Hotel. Oh, I'm like, I don't see it. I, I just, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I think, like, I just can't catch it. Like, I'm like, well, like, I'm, I'm listening to what they're saying. Like, okay, well, there's a window, which doesn't work. Like, there's no possible way there could be a window. And then I see them. I watch the scene, and they walk around, and I'm like, it, that, it, it totally works. I mean, I don't see where there's a fault yeah. there. I don't know. I just have to maybe look at it again closer. Hmm. But the, but yeah, the, the gun turret thing is interesting too. Uh, I never, I'd have to look at the movie again. It just, it always irks me every time. Even in Force Awakens, like Finn, you should be like hanging by the straps of that chair. <laughs> like, what the hell is going on? Well, hey, thanks, because now that's going to drive me insane. <laughs> <laughs> you're uh, you're welcome. Makes more sense that Han would go to the top one because it's easier to get in. I'm yeah, that one you're just pesky. laying in. Right? Yeah, right. you just get in there and lay back. But the other one, you're. And what really forward. is the point of the window at that point if you're just using a little computer to aim it, behind? It would probably be a little safer to have an electronic sort of. View. It's space, for God's sake. It's all about predicting your shot rather than, like, you know. There's... Well, that's different. In space, I, I understand. That makes more sense. I guess there is no, unless there's artificial gravity made by the ship, but there's really no gravity pulling you down or up yeah. or anything. So I'm just going to shut up about that then. I've been debunked. It would what seem. a total waste of time. <laughs> the, display <laughs> was just a, the display was just a wire frame of a TIE fighter. So Yeah, yeah. so why have that window there? I mean, wouldn't that window break out and, like, shrapnel hit your face at you the know, wrong point? It uh, seems uh, like a bit of a structural weakness yeah, but, in the cold vacuum of space. Yeah, you know? Just block it off and I'll stick with my little device I have to yeah, use anyway. Dang. Shoot here to win the fight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's move right on into uh, the part I'm really chomping at the bit here yeah, yeah. to do the uh, predictions we have for The Last Jedi. Um, with a few trailers we've seen and, uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook and all of our social media outlets throwing little teaser snippets out. Wh- where do we start? Uh, I'll start with James. What do you predict uh, we're going to see in The Last Jedi? Oh, I'd hate to give a lame ass answer, but I just I'm not predicting anything. I'm just kind of like waiting to just see it, I guess. Like, I'm not even like really getting myself hyped or anything like I I haven't been looking at a lot. I've seen the, uh, two trailers so far, but that's all. Um, but I haven't really given much thought. I, th- I think I just want to be surprised. But uh, but I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say. Okay, cool. I was hoping like you weren't going to be all like like bummed that like now we're going to be talking me about this. <laughs> I've been trying to stay away from it. Be quiet. I actually have a prediction about Luke's first words. Oh, okay. I think where's the beef? Where's the beef? Yeah. <laughs> well, you're not too far off from my theory here. I don't think they're going to be able to resist the temptation. At least I wouldn't to make it kind of a joke. Right, because it's this epic thing that you get this long, forlorn look. You know, Luke gazing right at Ray, very end of the movie, no words spoken, and that's become such a thing. I can only imagine, like, if it cuts right back in on the two. It's going to be one of two things. If it cuts right back in on that scene, he's going to look at her, his shoulders going to droop a little bit, and be like. Are you hungry? Or something to that effect. <laughs> Just like he's got a visitor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, come on in, let me get you something to drink or something. Or this one might be a little stupider and a little more far-fetched, but it cuts to them, like, at a table eating silently. And it's just like, will you pass the whatever, I don't know, blue milk or something? Yeah, there'll <laughs> you know? be blue milk for yeah. sure. <laughs> so that's, that's my thought. I know it's stupid, but something's telling me they're going to make it into, like, a little joke. Do you think that they're actually going to begin the movie with that scene? Oh, or, gosh, no. But <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I was just thinking about it. I was like, it's probably going to begin with some kind of space battle or yeah. something else happening, and then it's going to go into that. Um, but I don't know. Yeah. 
That'd be cool if they did the kind of Lord of the Rings thing and just pick up right where they left off. Uh, the there world were, um, is changing. I saw like not, in the world. Go like, ahead. Even Empire Strikes Back begins like that quick. It, it's kind of like it would be the first time we've seen a Star Wars movie pick up exactly where the last one left off. Yeah, that's right. It, it, that's so a, it couldn't because then the crawl would make no sense because. Well, if you saw in the movie last time, That's Ray true. walked up the hill. And... <laughs> so here we go. I'll say, uh, Ray walks up to Luke. <laughs> to exactly what happened. There's your crawl. Crossing a distance <laughs> of many inches, Ray approaches the Jedi Master. A Luke's... distance of many inches. <laughs> Luke stands there for 30 seconds with the strange, many different tones of eyebrow raises and furrows. <laughs> right. <laughs> Dot, a dot, veritable dot. dance. Then, it's, then there's like nothing. And then dot, 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 some more text comes up. <laughs> well, one thing um, I think we can expect from this movie that I hope is not the case is, uh, is too much fluff, too much comic relief. Okay. Mm. In Force Awakens, R2 was asleep. And R2 carries C3PO. So C3PO yep. is merely a cameo. Mm hmm. You know, and BB-8 was your prominent droid character. So with R2 awake now, are we really going to see, you know, R2 and C-3PO along with BB-8? Along with the plans, there's like a like a black evil BB-8 now that Ooh, we've yeah. seen, right? Mm-hmm. And um, BB not to six, mention... Six, six. Right, there you go. <laughs> That's a BB <laughs> worth having. Yeah. And also that little uh, the furry porg. animal thing that's sitting the porgs on the dash. Yeah. worried. Yeah, so with all these little uh, characters around, I hope they don't butt their way into the movie too much. I can't see them leaving R2 out. The thing that really drives me nuts about the Porg scene we get in the trailer is that Force Awakens, there was such a focus on practical effects. Like, that was part of their mission statement. Like, we're bringing practical effects back back into Star Wars mm -hmm. and then to see Chewie on screen you're like ah yeah there he is and then jump right to the fully CGI pork I'm just like ooh ugh, it just feels wrong you know yeah. I, I can't believe they skipped straight to special edition like they because <laughs> <I know. laughs> <laughs> they did all the yeah they made such a huge deal I, I was at the comic con panel and they that was like all they talked about was like oh yeah we're gonna do it's gonna be practical effects they, they brought an animatronic creature up on stage um, or a puppet or whatever it was, and then I remember um, they showed that uh, that that video, which was all about like them, you know, working on the effects and everything. And they're like, we're, right. we're doing it practical, we're doing it the right way. You put Simon Pegg in a costume that looks amazing with like prosthetics and stuff, and then they just CG'd over it. And I had no idea it was even a real thing. Like I watched the movie and was like, oh, okay, well that character's CG. And then they do all the motion capture stuff with Snoke and um, oh, there's like a few other characters that were all CG. But they, were, yeah, it was like they just kind of threw that idea away. I thought, and it didn't really bother me when I first saw it. I think they did a good job. But looking back, it's like if they made such a big deal to make it practical, then why did they cover it up with computers? That's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. If I hadn't even thought in, about Snoke in those terms. He is just a, he's just a CG. Pr I mean, you got Andy Serkis there doing the mocap yeah. and such, but he really is just a big Snoke CG is Andy Serkis. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if you're gonna have somebody, like he's have the might as well be him. Yeah, but, but yeah. you know, that wasn't what I ever saw. I mean, I, I understand like changing with the times, whatever. But you know, everybody one the, one of the biggest complaints about the prequel trilogies was just how much CG there was, and then they pretty much did the same thing. I think they kept the the background to be more. They built actual sets instead yeah. of putting yeah. just all it digital backgrounds done. in there. It was, it was much better done than the prequel trilogy, but... Like the whole droid factory in the Clone yeah. Wars. <laughs> yeah. CG yeah. yeah. nightmare. There's yeah. still this element of, like, you order a sandwich and it's just, like, destroyed with mayonnaise. You're like, there is way too much mayonnaise on this sandwich. <laughs> they're like, all right, all right. And they bring you another one. They're like, this one's got a little less mayonnaise. And I'm like, can we just <laughs> drop the mayonnaise? <laughs> I don't want shades of gray. Just fucking get me my sandwich. Right, for sure. Yeah, it's, it's crazy because, you know, the practical effects, even though sometimes... Like, I, I always go back to the uh, one of the creatures in the cantina in A New Hope. 
You know, his head bobs up and looks around. He kind of has those, like, Super Bowl with glitter in him yeah, eyes, yeah. you know. Not the best of effect, but still, you know, it, I think it lands home better it's, than just all CG with too much shit going right. on Right, and on the practical face. effects root you to the thing that's happening. Mm-hmm. It's, even though you can't reach out and touch it, your mind knows it's tangible and it feels real to you. Mm-hmm. CG yeah. just reminds you there's a screen between you and what's going on. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Just the simple fact that learning that Andy Serkis is going to be Snoke is like, wow, I had no idea. And I'm like even more sold on it now. He was fan fucking tastic as Caesar in War for Planet of the Apes. Oh, no question. By far one of the best movies of the summer, if not the best. It was phenomenal. That's going to be the best rebooted series ever. Dude, hands down. I mean, uh, he and Woody Harrelson opposite each other were just. What a great combination to have play off each other. The eccentricities of each, you know. I can't remember the last time, like, I... Like, we rented it. I saw it at home. And we sat down with dinner, you know. And probably about three quarters of the way through the movie, I realized I was sitting on the edge of the couch. <laughs> and my dinner had gone untouched and cold. I was just drawn in into this movie and couldn't get out. It was so damn good. But anyway, sorry, I don't mean to, to beat the <laughs> the drum that is Planet of the We're Apes. We're going to change gears, gentlemen. Welcome to our Planet of the Apes special. Well, Planet of the Apes. That'll be a conversation for another day right there. I'd have that conversation. Yeah, I would yeah, too. I would, uh, yeah. What about you, Jack? Any predictions? It's going to be like Empire. That's a very good point. Uh, a, oh, the kind sure. of training I have a, oh, I'm sorry. I do have a prediction. It's going to make a lot of money. Well, I don't know about that. Uh, the only thing so they don't true. show in the trailer that makes me think it's going to be is that there is a reveal of a family member, but I'm pretty sure that would have to happen. Yeah, that's going to happen. That's I mean, got they've to got that at some point. Imperial Walker battle. There's another shot of the Millennium Falcon shooting out of a hole in distress. Yeah. Like the asteroid from Empire. Uh, what else was I think that was about it. Well, you know, you bring up... Uh, the opening to my point, the, the difference I was going to say, you know, if to predict what's going to happen in The Last Jedi, I think we need only look at Empire. If you look at The Force Awakens, though it is the next chapter in the linear story, it's also a very effective reboot of uh, New Hope. I mean, you have it the droid with valuable information. With yeah, 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 for sure. And, uh, you know, just the destruction of the Death Star and Star Killer Base. They they echo each other very well, and I think they're going to probably stick to that formula with uh, Last Jedi and uh, also the Empire. training of another Jedi. And yeah. I have a feeling that she's going to go into some kind of cave where she has to meet her fear, fears, like Luke did when Vader showed up. Mm, good point. So, yeah, yeah. I think it's just going to. I don't care. I'm going to like it anyway. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, this isn't a prediction, but there was something I saw in the trailer that I really liked. It's the scene that is presumably when. If Kylo kills Leia, you know, he's barreling mm, down on that yeah. capital ship in his sleek custom fighter. And he's doing all these fancy maneuvers and 1080 spins and all this crazy stuff. And I liked that scene because in that moment I was like, this dude's a Skywalker. You know, yeah. it's like that's a hallmark of that yeah. family is that they're just for some reason quality pilots. <laughs> Which makes me think, well, maybe this is what you just said, Ray, is it Ray? Is a Skywalker. I mean, I mean right? she's got all the traits. She she knows how to do everything right off yeah, the bat. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's got to be the whole Star Wars story is about the Skywalker family. You That's, know, yeah, how one family just really screwed up an entire galaxy. <laughs> so Which rather than kind of like Natalie Portman, so like yeah. that, bit, yeah. it, would, it would make sense. Yeah, I saw a clickbait the other day with the title saying something about Ray being a Palpatine. Uh, but of course, I hope I not. I hope that. not. I hope yeah. not. God, I don't know. For all his awesome qualities, Palpatine doesn't strike me as a dude who's knocking it out of the park with the ladies. You're right, right. <laughs> I'm thinking his legacy is more figurative than literal. Despite his power, his groupies would have to be paid a handsome uh, amount of money to get have with him for a night. Have you ever seen me incinerate a man with lightning? It's like, yeah, why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I do think it's true that they are going to echo a lot of Empire Strikes Back, so that, that yeah. does seem kind of like... I, I think you could, because of how many things that they... Uh, they echoed in New Hope. Like you could make it into like a drinking game, probably. Like let's see how many empires yeah. <laughs> things happen now. 
That's a good point. And yeah. I kind of I kind of get it cuz what they're doing, like what they did with the first one, certainly they're selling nostalgia. Right. So yeah. it's going to have to be close enough to Empire that that nostalgia is still as heavy and, you know, you can still get as drunk off those old memories. <laughs> That's true. And you the know, member berries. I think got to be I right. Remember. I remember too. <laughs> no, I <laughs> Um, you know, it's definitely like a movie that exists because of other movies. It's not really like like if you didn't have the first like six movies that this one kind of it doesn't it wouldn't just start on its own i don't think cuz it's it's really drawn from those movies so yeah. much yeah exactly it couldn't come together in a vacuum it would it needs all of that mhm yeah and you know with the looking at the empire i obviously I mean, not that i'm saying anything prolific here but luke is stepping into that um that yoda role yeah from empire oh yeah and i'm really considered that everyone moves up a rank right <laughs> for the most part yeah and uh, Another thing that Disney has been really good about doing with Star Wars is, um, since they've acquired it, is paying homage to the ideas that were thrown on the table, you know, in the original trilogy or maybe in the prequels that weren't used and uh, bringing them back in new ways. For example, Starkiller Base, you know, it was originally supposed to be Anakin Starkiller Mm -hmm. in the uh, the original story. They obviously changed it, but they went back and used that name for that base. Um, from the show Rebels, Zeb, the the, the creature yeah. that's running with them. Uh, I'm gonna, I keep harking back to the Cincinnati uh, Star <laughs> Wars video, but there was concept of Chewbacca, concept drawings there as like kind of a and one of the concepts was almost an exact drawing, really, of Zeb from Rebels. Dang so God. they recycled that failed conceptual art and reused it for a new character. See, you that's know? cool that they're like mining the past for concepts. Right. Instead of doing like what the prequels did, we're just throwing a bunch of new stuff at us that is not like congruent right. with what and we Too used much to. new stuff. But uh, thrown uh, E.T. into the yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Senate. Right. Another thing though, um, BB-8 is a recycled idea. Not that the droid in its entirety was the original concept, but R2-D2 was originally conceptually drawn as the same trash can body with a dome top, but then the bottom of him was a round, just big bearing that he would roll around on. Hmm. That'd be a lot trickier at that time. Exactly, which is why they didn't go with it. But now, you know, in the age of technology where we are are able to do that, they uh, have brought that idea to life. So, you know, these trailers that have come out have led us to believe that Ray could possibly be looking down the path of the dark side. Like, I need someone to make sense of this for me. And, you know, Kylo holding his hand out. I think we're being led there. That's clever editing for the commercial, yeah. Yeah. And I think um, an idea from the past that was scrapped could be resurfaced here by chance. In Return of the Jedi, Lucas's original idea was to have Luke turn evil. And turned him good at the last minute for, you know, fan service. You know, that's what the fans don't want to see our hero become evil. They want to see him be good. And I think now we're in a better setting where the torch has been passed to a new uh, group of stars of the Star Wars, uh, you know, universe. And what used to be the main characters are now kind of side characters. I think we could actually see uh, Luke in his, you know, kind of in the same state Yoda was in, having been secluded so long and kind of gone a little mental with these powers and thinking that he's the reason, you know, the force has not been set right. I don't know. I can see him possibly uh, being put into a, an antagonist role. You know, it's funny. We've we've talked about this idea that, you know, he's got that line, the Jedi have to end. And where that's taken our thought process is that there has to be some path of moderation. Right. You know, the Jedi are too set in their ways. The Sith are too selfish. And the two breed conflict with one another. Mm-hmm. We've done that to death. But perhaps in his isolation and mulling over this guilt and going through all the events of the, that have torn this galaxy apart, maybe when he says the Jedi have to end, maybe he comes to regret the decision of training Rey. Maybe the way she seems to be joining forces with Kylo because they're both seeking the opposite part right. of this puzzle, maybe he takes it upon himself to stop this where it is. I see. You know, maybe that's the thing. Is he starts out that the would mentor, make sense. but almost like uh, you know, uh, what is it in in Doctor Strange? The way at the very end we see his his best friend count something yes. or another. Yes, it's like no, too many sorcerers. You know, yeah. just, <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> yeah, there was a comic, uh, Dark Empire, which 
I remember before when episode seven was just like a, you know, a theory like that it wasn't even going to happen or not. Right. Um, I remember uh, digging up some quote. George Lucas said that the Dark Empire comic was the closest to an episode seven that he ever thought of. And in that one, uh, Luke turns evil. So it, it kind of, um, I always kind of had that idea in my head, like, oh, yeah, if they do episode seven, Luke's going to turn evil. And then once the movie came, and then it's like, okay, well, they're probably not doing that. I guess there's still that possibility, but I've, I kind of forgot about that for a while. So I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, because, you know, another thing that's kind of, I, I don't see this as a probable outcome. It probably isn't going to be the case, but it's not impossible and you know when they released two different posters you know a light and a dark poster one that has ray on the front with the blue saber going up the middle the other with kylo with the red saber and in both of them you know where like in the classic posters vader's face is kind of washed out big and luminous in the background in the top corner you have luke's head in each of those on the light side he's shown and then in the dark poster he's shown up in that corner too it just there's something about it that has me wondering. Could be a contractual thing, you know, advertising <laughs> and having his likeness on every piece of promotional material. Oh, well, yeah, but obviously. But that's just keeping the question on if he's yeah. going to go good or bad, I bet. Right, yeah, yeah. I, I certainly think that's an element of it. And just the simple fact that they're trying to lead us in one way um, with you believing Ray might be bad. I think they're trying to get it, knock us off the trail of They want us to doubt Luke maybe wherever we're coming him. from, you know. And, you know, people might say, well, if he were to be Luke, that'd show a flaw in the character, you know, and you, nobody look at him the same again. But I think what this, what Disney has done with the Force is they've changed the Force. The Force in the past movies has always kind of been something that you can use and harness and practice with and uh, use to your advantage you know, if you're good or evil. But what's kind of been cemented with Disney is the Force has kind of its own agenda and that we are just kind of pawns in the greater plan. I see what you the rails of the Force. Like the Saber calling to Rey. Right. You know, like, this is your path. You know, hearing, like, uh, what's, excuse me, uh, what's the guy who originally played Obi-Wan in New Hope? Uh, Sir Alec Alec Guinness. uh, Guinness. 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 Thank you. You know, you hear him go, Ray. And then you hear Yoda say, Ray. People, two characters who have been long dead, you know. Do you guys see what I'm saying? The Force hasn't laid out before the characters realize what's happening on. It's almost like one of those things where, you know, they're always talking about the balance. There needs to be balance. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's imbalanced. The Sith are in power, blah, blah, blah. But the Force is is the one actively pursuing that balance. Right. And maybe in doing that, it sees that Luke has to take on this persona that isn't so much himself. And everyone sees these figures as being like the prime movers of the setting. It's like, oh, balance has been brought back to the Force because Vader killed Palpatine. Now Vader's dead and Luke carry on the blah, blah, blah. But it's the Force manipulating its pawns. Right. Exactly. And that's how I see it. In Rebels, they've got like these Force creatures that are almost like... I don't know, force gods or something like that. Right. That they've talked to. And, you know, not only that aspect, but you see new aspects of the force, like with Kylo Ren being able to, you know, hold his hand out and pull yeah, memories yeah. Minds, from yeah. someone's mind. And Very it's psychological. Just, I mean, you've always had the Jedi mind trick, but now he's in there. It's know? a new look at the force that uh, we haven't seen before. So I don't know. Just just a thought that popped into my head there. That's all I have on my list. Uh, do you guys have any other predictions or thoughts from uh, The Last Jedi? What yeah, I never even thought about how many characters could come back, really, because, you know, like, Yoda is a ghost, so you could, you could have Yoda. Um, exactly. You know, even Anakin. Um, oh, jeez. how that would work. The young Anakin. I so swear like, I had like, heard a long time ago that he had been reached out to. I uh, remember hearing about Christian that Christian Hayden. Yeah. What is that how you say his name? Christian Hayden Hayden Christensen, I thought. Thank oh, you. Yeah. You're welcome. Boy, I butchered the hell out of that, didn't I? <laughs> I was right there with but you. you had all the constituent <laughs> parts. All the pieces were there, just yeah. not in the right places. But yeah, You had me. <laughs> <laughs> but I had, I swore I had heard that he had been, rumor had it, he had been reached out to about future obligations with uh, the new trilogy. Yeah, I remember hearing Because I, I just too. loved, you know, no matter how bad 
that original pre- the prequel uh, stories were that they were not going to ignore them and tie them in congruently. And, you know, like with Rogue One, having Bail Organa in there, that was huge. Yeah. That was a huge. really nice touch, I think. Even though he's kind of thrown in your face. He just kind of vamps in. Look who's here. It's Bail. <laughs> Very dragon Bail, present. You know, <laughs> just doing roll call or something. All right, guys. Anything else? I don't know. I think we've covered it. I think we did a damn good job. That was yeah. a hell of a lot of fun. It certainly was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll have to do this again uh, sometime, maybe on a different movie sure. uh, of choice. But um, yeah. before we wrap up, James, I feel like we ought to uh, just ask you how things are going over at Cinemasker and what's new and uh, what, what's down the line. Oh, good. Um, j- just working on videos. <laughs> it's pretty <Yeah>. much. <laughs> There's some more uh, nerd videos coming up. Um, uh, I got a batch of those in production. I gotta say, really quick, since you mentioned nerd videos, your Polybius video was perfect High quality. <laughs> it was a great jump scare at the very end because yes. I about shit my pants. Well, I've been listening. We mm-hmm. had a guest on the show who had a comic based on mm-hmm. Polybius, and that in turn then got me listening to a podcast called the Polyb- Polybius uh, Conspiracy. Have you guys been listening to that? Any of you? No, not yet. Oh, oh, I heard of it. Yeah. It's really good. I mean, it, there's parts of it you're like, is this staged? But it's mm-hmm. pretty cool. And then to see your video pop up at uh, in the yeah. height of my investigation was like, oh, perfect. <laughs> the I stars the alive. year of Polybius. I don't know what it is, but this year of all years, everybody's doing Polybius videos. Yeah. And, I, and uh, like I wasn't aware of it. Like I had it planned for Halloween. But then it was like all these videos are popping up. Um like that amazing documentary from Ahoy, like was just like history channel quality. Um, but it's like this for some reason this year, it's like tons and tons of stuff. I don't know. I guess that's just the way th- things are a lot of times. But but this th- the legend's been going on for like d- decades. Yeah, since the early 80s. And it's uh, nothing I knew about until we had that uh, gentleman. on. Who was that? Yeah. You remember the yeah. name of that? Well, it's possible the legend didn't really start till 2003, but they say it goes back to 81 or 82. Um, so it's not really conclusive. I first heard about it, I think. I was in Portland recently. I mean, or last last year, I think around October, I was in Portland, and uh, uh-huh. somebody gave me uh, some fan art of it. And uh, I was like, oh, what's this? It's like, oh, it's Polybius. It's this like urban legend game, and... And then I started hearing some more stuff about it later, and I was like, okay, this, this might make for a good episode. We'll, we'll see. Wasn't uh, Portland, was Oregon Ground Zero for the Polybius conspiracy? Uh, or where Portland was, it? was where it was supposed to have happened. Like where, that's the, Portland, the you said. Yeah, Oregon, yeah. Okay. You mentioned a documentary just a second ago. What was that called? There's actually more than one, but uh, I'm sure one, the channel is Ahoy, I believe. And uh, he did this like really amazing, um, like hour long uh, or more than an hour, uh, like video, basically trying to like get to the bottom of where it started. And then there's also a documentary that I is like a Kickstarter that's like being uh, funded. But that one is like uh, like a lot of interviews. Um, so it's kind of like more than one voice. It's like a bunch of people talking and I don't, I don't know if that one's like, if that one has like a, like a release date or anything like that, but there's a bunch of stuff really. Like if you keep looking, there's like so much Polybius stuff that all happened this year. I'll have to look for that documentary. That'd be cool. I didn't know one existed. I should have known. <laughs> but uh, okay. I did not. <laughs> Yeah. Like that one's a lot more scholarly. It's like, um, if you're like looking to, um, get like as much factual data about it as you can i mean pretty much it 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 seems like the legend was just made up like it's not it it never was a real thing but right but it makes for great stories for sure and that's kind of the same uh, you know that uh, podcast that i was mentioning the polybius uh, conspiracy it's not so much just a few people like you know this like sitting around these are two guys who are out finding people who are on the scene the owners of said arcade people who claim to have been there and you know they started down this road of interviews one thing leading to another that just kind of like the farther it goes like i don't get me wrong i'm intrigued by it but i'm like is this real like these, <laughs> some of this shit has got me scratching my head but and then the aliens show up <laughs> <laughs> but still i recommend checking it out but um 
anyway, James, I want to thank you so much for taking time to uh, talk with us today. This has been a blast. And for our uh, uh, listeners and viewers at home, because this is also going to be on YouTube. That it is. Uh, who haven't checked out James and his work, which seems very unlikely. I, I think at this uh, point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but if by chance you hadn't, head over to Cinemasker.com and check out all the videos he's got going on there. Some great shit. You, I tell you, I've fallen asleep to so many angry video games uh, nerd seasons playing on the television. Is that good? <laughs> what? Oh, fall that asleep? Good? <laughs> well, no, it's like I I didn't mean it like that. Like I put them on and I watch them until I fall asleep and I wake up and they're still going. So, go hey, that's got to count for some ad revenue, videos. right? When I've got insomnia. <laughs> <laughs> when, I'm, when I need to be bored out of my fucking skull. No, that's not what I meant at all. Please excuse me. Back. Actually, I've heard that a lot, though. Like, a lot of people, like, leave it on when they go to sleep. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's something uh, comforting about then it. Then they I have really, really angry dreams. <laughs> <laughs> really Swearing and throwing shit in your <laughs> seat. Right, right. <laughs> they wake up feeling guilty for some reason. Right. Like, but thanks so much uh, again, James. This has been a blast. Oh, cool. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. Jack, what do we have on the website? Go to cannedairpodcast.com where you can see show highlights, guest info, listen to the show, the show, follow us on all our social media, check out our special guest page and see some of our special guests. Click the merch button to buy some uh, merch and check out some <laughs> of the videos sense. from our YouTube page. <laughs> also, if you'd like to get a hold of us, uh, be a guest on our show, send us an email on our contacts page. And don't forget, that's Twitter, at Canned Air Pod, Instagram, at Canned underscore Air. If you're looking for that merch, society6.com forward slash Canned Air Pod. And if you're attending a Wizard World convention in the near future, use promo code Canned Air, lowercase no space, at checkout for 10% off. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And again, don't forget to go to our YouTube page and uh, subscribe to what we got going on there. A lot of, lots of good stuff starting yeah. to trickle on to Plenty YouTube. more on the way. Mm-hmm. Kind of set stagnant for a while just like some con coverage videos coming up we had uh, to figure out what we're doing with it yeah again the star wars video if you're listening to this you got to be a star wars fan go check it out power of the costume uh, exhibit on youtube and the grave of the vampire uh, movie riff that we did and our patreon page uh we just want to again ask you if you are enjoying what we're doing here on canned air and want to show a little bit of support even if it's a dollar a month dollar a month head over to patreon and uh just click that uh what is it what Back this person Back the, button. Yeah. <laughs> Hit the button that gives us a dollar a month. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and if, you know, we understand money can be tight. If you're not able to do that, you can still support us just by simply leaving a comment on iTunes. That would That's be greatly appreciated. Uh, also, if you uh, want to check on some of our later catalog, go back to episode 173. You can listen to the first time we had James on the show where we just talk all things James and see what it's like to uh, live a day in the life of the video game. That was a great time, nerd. too. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, Stranger Things being all the rage right now Episode 176 We have a panel we recorded of Millie Bobby Brown sure At the did. Cleveland Wizard World Con That was a lot of fun And episode 195 where me and you talk about Star Wars and IHOP Two great things episode. that belong right next to each <laughs> yeah, other right? Two great tastes That taste great together Damn right I like that <laughs> Well I think that's going to do it this week So uh, until next time I am Jeremy Colley I'm Jack Doherty I'm Jake Runyon And I'm James Rolfe Thanks for listening everyone 